very much for joining us this evening. We're delighted to uh, have you at our latest YPN discussion. My name is Darren Moriarty and I'm the chair of the YPN here at the Institute. Um, this evening we're joined by a great lineup of speakers, experts and commentators to share their views on some of the impacts that COVID-19 is having on the economy, on arts and culture and on sport. Um, the format for this evening is going to go as follows. We'll begin with some opening questions to our panellists. Um, they'll each give initial responses about five or seven minutes or so. We'll then move on to a bit of a discussion between ourselves and then we'll open it up to the floor. If you want to get involved in the discussion, uh, please do so using the Zoom Q&A function. And also, if you want to get involved in the discussion on Twitter, you can do so using the handle at IIEA. We're going to record the full session this evening and then throw it up on our YouTube afterwards. Um, so you can... You can watch back if, if you need to. Um, let me just now quickly introduce our speakers. Um, first, we have Ken Early. Ken is co-presenter of the Second Captains podcast. He's also a columnist with the Irish Times. Um, for those unfamiliar with the Second Captains is the sports and current affairs podcast. The Second Captains World Service is the third largest podcast in the world on Patreon with approximately 12,000 subscribers. Uh, next is Nadine O'Regan. Nadine is founder and presenter of My Roots, and, My Roots Are Showing which is an interview-based podcast focusing on arts, culture, and politics. Uh, she's taken up a new and exciting role as editor of the Business Post magazine, and she's also head of podcasting with the Business Post. Um, throughout 2019, she's presented the Business Post's Coronavirus Ireland podcast. She's a contributor to RT Radio, and she was previously presented with Phantom FM and Today FM. And lastly, then, we have Barra Roundtree. Barra's an economist with the Economic and Social Research Institute, and his work at the SRI focuses on taxation, welfare, pensions. He's been very active in examining the, in examining the impact that COVID-19 has had on unemployment, consumption and tax in Ireland. Um, in 2020, Barra won the prestigious uh, Barrington Medal, which was awarded by the Statistical and Social Inquiry Society of Ireland. That's the SSISI. Um, it's great to see an organisation that has an even more complicated acronym than the IIEA. Um, you're all very welcome this evening. Thanks very much for taking the time to join us. And Barrett, we'll start with yourself, I suppose, on the economic side of things. We've seen the economic impact, you know, of COVID-19 across all sectors. But can you talk to us maybe just in terms of this audience, mm -hmm. its specific impact on, on younger people? Yeah, sure. And I might throw up a few slides just to kind of uh, give you, because I, I, think, I think much of what I'm going to say won't necessarily surprise you in terms of you know, the, the crisis has disproportionately hit young adults. But I think it's the extent to which that is true that is um, really important. And that's something which I certainly find difficult to uh, express in words anyway, but it's easier to express in, in pictures. So um, just to show you uh, a little bit about... Um, a, a little bit on 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 this uh, topic. So, first up, like the what I want to start off by just kind of outlining is that the pandemic has really hit youngest workers hardest in terms of the job losses. So, if we're to take those people who were in work um, back at the end of last year uh, and uh, we're, we're to express the number of claims there's been for the pandemic unemployment payment, that's the the new job seekers payment people have been able to claim if they lost work because of the pandemic. You can see that you know. That suggests that about 60% of, at, at the peak of the rises in kind of May, at the start of May, end of April, about 60% of 18, 19 year olds had lost their job. Almost half of 20 to 24 year olds, about 27% of 25 to 34 year olds. And then for the older age groups, it's all about 22%, 21%. And, you know, I, I think just it's really striking just how much the brunt of this crisis in terms of job losses has fallen on younger workers. You know, so more than 50% of those aged 18 to 24 compared to about, about a fifth of, of those over 20, over 25. So really the crisis has fallen there. And I think there's reasons to be seriously concerned about that into the longer run. Um, the first reason I think is that this group has been, you know, they're also hit hardest last time. Um, so here, this isn't data from Ireland, but it's actually something in feature in the Financial Times this weekend, which uh, excellent if, if you can go and hunt it out. Uh, I think it was they titled this The Recessionals. Um, but essentially what it shows is that it, the financial crisis in the, in the US is disproportionately affected millennials. Um, it affected everyone, but in terms of employment and earnings, which are shown there on, on, on that, uh, those charts, for millennials, it fell by most. So of course, the crisis relative to where you would expect their earnings to be, Earnings fell by about 15%, employment by about 10%. And it's taken the best part of 10 years to recover. Um, so we're getting back kind of to where we were 
and where would you expect to be in terms of employment? Not, not in terms of earnings, though. Earnings were still about 10% lower than you would otherwise expect from millennials. Less so for, for those from the previous one, which Generation X and baby boomers even, even you know, they weren't as affected as much when the crisis hit and they recovered much more quickly. So I think that kind of gives additional concern for why we should be worried about the fact that this crisis is hitting young adults so much. And the other thing in my mind that makes me particularly worried is that we just know that younger workers are more likely to be renters. Again, that's not particularly shocking, but I think here I'm just outlining what proportions of young uh, workers in those age bands I showed you previously live in rented accommodation. And you can see for those below the age of 44, it, it's just much, much larger. So, you know, the youngest age group, 18, 19, many of them are living at home, so it's only about 17%. But for those in their 20s in particular, you're talking about, you know, between, you know, over, over a third, probably an average, if you take those, the, the 20, 24 and 25, say, to 30 group together, you're talking about well over a third living in rented accommodation. Um, and for me, that raises particular concerns because, you know, those are people who face the highest housing costs. We know that from lots of work that's been done and we know that how those you know those housing costs are going to remain even if those jobs aren't coming back for a good long time and so that that's when something that makes me really worried too so to express that another way you know essentials which can't be shifted and they are primarily housing costs but also things like groceries they might make up a much larger share of spending for renters than owner occupiers so that's what i'm showing here on this graph this is just the the share of total expenditure made up where i've colored in green essentials again mostly groceries and and, and housing costs the red bar is restricted items, so eating out, drinking out in pubs, that, that stuff that you can't do at the moment or couldn't do at least up until a week or two ago and still might be hesitant about doing. And then other is just the residual, the rest of the stuff. And you can see for private renters, essentials make up almost half of all their spending. Uh, that's the same for, you know, it's a little bit less, but about the same kind of ballpark for other renters. Uh, there are people, say, renting from local authorities or approved housing bodies. For owner occupiers, it's much smaller. It's about a third. Um, and so for me, that raises a big issue in that simply those who are more, most likely to have lost their job and to be affected in terms of, 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 of the crisis in, ter in terms of their, their job have, are least able to weather it. They're least likely they're, they have the highest housing costs. They also have the least stocks of wealth to enable them to you know, cushion out that what might be a year, two years, who knows, um, shock. And so that's something that makes me quite worried. And so I just want to kind of, I think, think knitting that all together, I think you know, the reason that economists particularly are so worried now about job losses is that there's a really big body of evidence that's emerged in the last 20 years or so that's shown that job losses have these scarring effects what they're called uh, on later life outcomes so it's not just that you know people who maybe lose their job are, are tend to be in bad situations and that's why they lost their job this is if you look at the effect of recessions where a load of people lose their job at the same time or a factory closes down and you trace through what happens to these people when they lose their jobs we know that their earnings, employment and education are going to be much lower up for you know, 10, 20 years after that there's really long run impacts uh, on average for people who lose their jobs. But not only just that, even in terms of criminal convictions, there's been evidence to suggest that you know, if, you know, if you leave school when times are bad and there aren't any jobs around, you're far more likely to be charged with the crime in the future. Also divorce, you're far more likely to end up divorced. So these things matter. Losing your jobs matter. Um, other reason I think this matters is because I think it's really likely to exacerbate an existing, existing inequalities, all sorts of existing ones, but the one that I want to just kind of pick up on before finishing is, is wealth. So we know home ownership rates have plummeted for, for young adults. Um, I'm not really, again, sure that we can quite realise the extent to which that's true. So for those who are aged 25 to 34, back in 1991, 68% of them owned their own house through a mortgage or outright. That's fallen to 30% by more than half. So it's kind of absolutely collapsed. In, in terms of home ownership. And that really matters just to link back to kind of what, what I've been showing you in that owner occupiers face those lower housing costs. They're also less likely to be affected by a job loss or pay cut. And that means they're more likely to be able to be in a position where they continue accumulating uh, wealth over the next years or two. We know from stats that the central bank have put out and others that deposits in, in, uh, bank, uh, in banks around Ireland are going up. So, you know, those who have money are saving it because they've not been really suspended on. There, you know, there's whole swathes of the economy that are shut down. So given that, I think what we are, are likely to see at the end of this crisis is both an increase in intergenerational wealth uh, inequality in terms of those people who are lucky enough to be in positions that own their own house, they're going to have accumulated more assets and more wealth, whereas those who aren't are going to have still been paying rent through it. And you know, there's quite a lot of people who are very far away from being close to owning a house. And so even if property prices fell a bit, it doesn't really matter. They're not that close to it. So I think it has a real potential to open up that intergenerational divide, which was existing before. But also, I think it has the potential to open to, to exacerbate 
even within a generation. You know, there are those people such as myself who haven't, you know, our job hasn't really been affected so much by this crisis. We're still able to work from home. We're able to, you know, remote work. There's lots of people who aren't in that position. And I think they're the people who are really going to bear the brunt of this crisis. And given the effects that we know that, again, job losses have have on people, I'd be very concerned about that. Uh, not to kind of like round it off by cementing the economist's uh, role as the dismal science, but the thing that actually maybe strikes me most of what we've seen uh, in terms of data coming out in recent weeks is one from the CSO. And that shows that young adults have actually gone from being the most likely to report high overall life satisfaction, about 50% of them two years ago in the last survey that was done, to the least likely, only 10% of them. Um, and kind of, you know, when you when you look at what's going on, it's not really kind of surprising that's happening. And I think people kind of know it, but that does really raise questions about what are we going to do about it, and what are the consequences of this if 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 we don't do something to address it. So I'll, I'll leave it there on, on a kind of a, a dismal note. But I think uh, hopefully not, hopefully not to, to start it off too too, too depressing, uh, Stephen. Thanks, Barra. Yeah, well, I can't get much more depressing than that, I'd say. Um, you know, lovely, lovely, nice, upbeat start to the evening. Uh, Nadine, you've the you've the rescue now after Barra. Coming yeah. to you from I'm the. I'm such a downer now. I don't know where to go from that. But Sorry. <laughs> honestly, I mean that's such a great summation of where we're at. Really clear and really crystallised for me. Um, that that central point, which is that the people that are already wealthy and that are already in a particular demographic will continue to be wealthy and continue to sort of get their way through this sort of COVID crisis era. Uh, it's been really difficult to watch on and see how people in their 20s are suffering. They're suffering actually from loss of opportunity, loss of the capacity to be themselves. Like I talk to people all the time who are in uh, different professions like acting, theater, uh, music. Uh, there's so many bands out there who are on the cusp of, you know, they've just signed deals or they signed deals uh, with record labels in the last year or two. This was going to be their year. Their album was going to come out. There are debut authors whose books either emerge in the middle of the pandemic and the bookshops were closed and nobody heard, nobody read their books or their books have been delayed till 2021. I was talking to a books publicist today and she said that autumn is going to be busier than ever for them because they have a glut of books now. And that may sound like a very positive situation. Oh, there's tons of books coming out in autumn and the bookshops will be open. But the reality is for people that those little authors who were going to try and make it in, in the sort of spring months, which is the month, these are the months where debut authors, generally speaking, are given a bit of a chance. They're going to be squashed by the big autumn books, the Christmas bestsellers. So you won't hear about them particularly because if you do go into a bookshop or you do order online, you'll buy that author who has that big book out in October, November that you want to buy for your dad for Christmas or you want to buy it for yourself. Um, those are the kind of authors that will continue to do well. And of course, we're looking at a situation where theatres are closed and well, trying to reopen. We're seeing a lot of obviously virtual theatre. And then there's productions. For example, um, I did an interview with um, Ed Guiney from Element, um, and Element are the production house who would have brought you like really big award-winning films like Room, for example, Emma Donoghue's Room, but also Normal People, which was such a huge hit on RTE. But one of the things that Ed said was that they finished the, the production of Normal People by the skin of their teeth, and they were supposed to be going into production for Conversations with Friends, which is Sally Rooney's um, other book, her first book. And if you think about it, so many of the scenes, like how would they manage with social distancing how would they block the scenes how would any of it be possible so you know there are an awful lot of productions um, that will be halted and then there are books that are optioned uh, that you know at any one time element has about 30 books on its slate that may or may not go into production and probably every year maybe two or three of those books could go into production and now there's this just again this huge sort of cessation of activity uh, is what we're seeing and at the same time, we have a new government, we have a new minister handling a brief 
uh, that is so long that I, I just keep wanting to call her the Minister for Fun, but uh, Catherine Martin is obviously the Minister for Media, Tourism, Arts, Culture, Sport and the Grail Tucked. And you could add, I don't know, everything else besides. I mean, it's like she's doing everything. And for some people, particularly people who care about the arts, that's hard to hear because, of course, we want to think that the person who's being put in charge uh, at the moment uh, of the arts would have a portfolio that was maybe a little bit more concentrated purely on the arts. As it's difficult, of course, for everyone who's who's also sandwiched in as part of that brief. Um, but as we know, we've looked at um, you know this, the situation around, I suppose, loss of opportunity. But um, the fact is. Ireland pays great lip service to its artists. We regularly quote Yeats, we talk about Beckett, we love James Joyce. But when it comes down to it, how much money do we actually give artists? We don't actually give artists very much money. And then sometimes the kind of funding we do allocate to them, we sort of make them jump through strange hoops to get it. So it's been really interesting to note in the COVID era that there were other countries, for example, Germany or Scotland, who have simply allocated financial resources to their artists and they've said to them, make art. But unfortunately, what happened in Ireland some months back was artists were told to apply for one-off uh, amounts of funding totaling around 3,000, where they would create sort of um, almost like social media videos of what they do. So for example, a musician could do a performance on Facebook and he would get his three grand. But what if you were a lighting designer? How can you be a lighting designer and have the theater closed and not be able to, to do your work, but you can't kind of light stuff on Facebook for a video that people aren't going to pay or they're not going to give you funding for that. So it felt like some people in the arts were able to apply for funding, but other people weren't able to apply for funding. So there's a lack of, I suppose, um, equal opportunity there for artists. Um, so I think just for me, um, I'm, I'm really concerned. I, I understand that, of course, I mean, I present the Coronavirus Ireland podcast. I listen every day to stories of uh, vaccines um, and, and genuine serious issues that are affecting people in this country. But the one thing that I would say about the arts that we can't forget is that the arts nurtures us in terms of our mental health and well-being. And if we don't have things like uh, opportunities to go to the theater or to uh, take in cinema if we if we lose the opportunity to make art in the way that we should be able to do then that will have a substantial effect on our mental health that will create a situation where we're more likely to be depressed we're more likely to struggle in our relationships and everything is plays into the, the same situation which is a very glum reality uh, particularly for younger people coming up and you know, finally, I suppose, just, just coming back to um, what Barry was saying, you know, I do feel like when I look around and I, I see who is suffering most in this particular COVID era, I think the over 70s and the under 30s are the two um, demographics that I really worry for because the over 70s have huge health concerns every time they step outside the door. And the under 30s, they can't go in J1s, they, they can't travel to, to other countries to seek out professions, they can't enter into the kind of jobs that a lot of us would have been able to enter into early in our careers to get the experience to move on to better things. So um, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that we really strongly need to look um, both at the arts and at particularly the under 30s because uh, you know, this is the beginning of, of what could be a really difficult time for people in terms of their mental health and that may have very long lasting repercussions for them. Uh, so I would be very worried. It is bleak. It is bleak. It is bleak. Uh, two or four speakers painting a very bleak picture, Ken. Um, if we move on, maybe just to, to a specific topic for you, maybe just focusing on football. Um, you know, we saw lots of competing self-interests come into play when it came to the return of football and, um, you know, television money, sporting integrity. What have you made of how it sort of returned from to be behind those doors? And, and, and how do you think it's going to sort of uh, pan out as in terms of squashing this season and then starting the next season? Well, um, the football across most of Europe is now sort of back up and running. Um, not as normal, obviously, because there's no fans at the games in almost all the leagues. Um, Ireland hasn't restarted yet. July 31st, I think, is the is the start. I mean, what happened was, 
Uh, although in, in some countries, for instance, France and the Netherlands, it's been cancelled altogether until next season. They made that decision at the end of April, sort of at the peak of the, um, or just after maybe the peak of the, uh, the crisis in those countries in terms of deaths and hospitalizations and so on. Um, uh, much to the annoyance, I think, of a lot of the clubs in those countries uh, who felt that maybe a bit more time. Germany was the, the country that sort of led the return because they had managed the situation a little bit better than some of the other larger countries. And then once they were playing football, it sort of seemed as though, well, you know, we can do this. Uh, we can do this too. So the other major leagues, Spain, uh, England, Italy, eventually followed suit. Um, really, the, the, the thing, um, the, the main reason why they're all back, e even though there are no fans there and so on, is, is the need to fulfill television contracts, the need to deliver television content, which is what they get paid for. I mean, in Ireland, it's been a different case. You know, it, as a, the TV money is, is comparatively negligible, so gate receipts are a much bigger share of revenue. If you don't have fans, you don't have an economically viable league. So it's taken longer to sort out, you know, how are we going to actually pay for this when it returns? Um, the actual return itself um, was quite controversial. Uh, like there was a debate initially over the kind of morality of, of this, you know, is it right to be playing football in, in the pandemic? Uh, people are dying. Uh, there's the issue of the safety of the players. There's the issue of whether the players are equally at risk. Are players from certain ethnic groups more at risk? Uh, is it, it, the question of the justice of the voting uh, scarce testing resources to uh, testing footballers in order to be able to play matches and so on. And then also the more football specific question of whether it was right to play the game without supporters. You know, this, the, the slogan being football without fans is nothing is, a, you know, it's a, it's like a kind of an ultra slogan. Um, you know, the fans are obviously the people who give this meaning, uh, who provide the atmosphere, the excitement, the sense that, that this is something important. They're also the ones who pay for everything. So how can you really play this game without those people there? Uh, the answer is, it turns out that football will happily go on without fans, if that is the only way to collect the TV money. People have been watching it on TV, even though it's been bad. Um, some games have had record audiences. Uh, you know, they've, they have fake noise. Uh, I mean, it turns out that most people prefer fake noise. Most people, even though it's horrible, would rather have a fake comforting familiar soundscape than the real empty alienating one that, that, that people at the game are actually hearing. I mean, in terms of what's actually been different about the game since it's, since it's returned, you know, there are minor technical points which are of, of no interest really. You know, you don't have lots of angry people shouting at the players. So, you know, you've seen a slightly more patient, slightly less hurried, calmer, more composed type of game. The biggest difference, the, the, the only really significant difference has been the sudden politicization of the game. Uh, I mean, it's not as though, you know, politics has, has always been absent from football. So, I mean, f football, particularly in England, has always been part of a, a kind of ongoing culture war. Uh, traditionally, it's been an easy way for uh, right-wing media to demonize a successful uh, young working class men. You know, look at the, how these trash spend their money. Um, the soldiers should be getting footballers' wages, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> So when the pan pandemic shut everything down, and it should be noted, actually, in England, the, the league cancelled itself before the government made the decision. You know, the, the league was ahead of the government. The league eventually was like, you know, we can't do this. The manager of Arsenal's got coronavirus. This is crazy. They haven't told us to stop, but we feel like we have to. Uh, so they did. Within a couple of weeks, you had the health secretary in the UK, Matt Hancock, saying, you know, footballers need to stump up money to help pay for the NHS. Um, you know... A, a, a weird intervention from him, but it's always sort of been popular to sort of point the finger at them and say, oh, they get too much money. Um, you know, they're, they're mainly uh, young working class uh, guys. Uh, they did eventually come forward with an initiative called Players Together, um, <clears throat> part of which is supporting or, or payments to the NHS. But by the time this league resumed, it was a couple of weeks after the killing of George Floyd. Obviously, you had these massive protests in full swing. Um, all over uh, Europe, all over the United States. Uh, and the players decided that they wanted to show their support for Black Lives Matter. And so we've seen since the player, since the Premier League came back, we've seen players are wearing Black Lives Matter logos on their, uh, on their kit. Uh, and 
and at the beginning of every game, they've been taking the knee. You know, they've, they've, the whistle goes and all the players take the knee. You know, some of them are giving the raised fist salute. Um, this is a really radical change for a league that has always tried to be, you know, blandly apolitical, above and, like above and beyond politics in order to not to alienate any uh, possible customers. I mean, of course, it actually represents uh, a very specific politics, the Premier League. You know, it's, it's like nakedly capitalistic. It's sort of globally oriented, uh, generates huge uh, wealth, which then gets divided in massively unequal ways and does all this, it's sort of a model of this kind of thinking. It's like, well, of course, th things are that way. I mean, how else should it be? Why, you know, why, why should uh, the, the lower club, you, you know, within the actual Premier League itself, there's a certain uh, equality of distribution because they do still recognize at some level that like the bottom teams have to have some money uh, or you're going to have a league which is, is of no interest to anyone to watch. But that's, you know, that's what the league kind of represents. The point is that they haven't allowed players previously to, to, demonstrate, to uh, express political views before. Um, you know, on, on occasions when players have done that, they've been fined. And uh, now obviously since, since this has been happening on this mass scale at every game, this organized way, there has been a media backlash to this. Uh, you've got some of the media in the UK saying, you know, Black Lives Matter are Marxist revolutionaries, uh, Black Lives Matter are anti-Semitic, uh, and then more generally, you know, sports and politics shouldn't mix, uh, echoing this similar uh, kind of culture where you've had in the United States, you know, this sort of shut up and dribble, uh, you know, saying, you know, when I turn on sport, I want to watch sport, I don't want to be lectured, but, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, the, <clears throat> the issue actually came up in a in a parliamentary hearing where the chief executive of the Premier League was was being questioned by these MPs and, and he, he was getting kind of uncomfortable and he was saying stuff like, look, you know, we're we're in favor of like the sentiment Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, like, you know, obviously uh, we're, we're for that, you know, we're, uh, while trying to, it's, it appears sort of sidestep or back away from some of the more specific uh, political uh, aims, you know, like uh, defund the police. We're not sure, about, you know, we, no one's anywhere with the police, you know, this kind of stuff. So you can see the league already is thinking, you know, we're, we're, we, we feel like we're on thin ice here, but it's difficult for them, as far as I can see, to, to roll back from an initiative that has come from the players. You know, it's a, the, the, what we've seen, uh, the lesson, I guess, is the players and many of the coaches are more progressive than the administrators and the media, I guess, um, you know, which which is reflecting, I suppose, the generational divide that's become pretty evident in UK politics over the last few years. You know, you have you haven't seen. I'm not aware of anyone in the in the Premier League say who's been saying, "Oh, you know, I don't want to wear a mask." You know, masks are. You know, what, what's all this about masks? You know, yeah, it, it hasn't happened. Like they've just been saying, "Well, of course, you know, we'll reduce the chances of infection." I mean, not all of them. A lot of them wear the mask with the nose sticking out, but you know. I haven't seen anyone make a point of saying, oh, this is ridiculous, my freedoms, you know. You know, in terms of the long-term effects of, of this, it's hard to, it's hard to really predict, uh, but it is, it's impossible to see how the Premier League can now object in principle to political expressions uh, and complications therefore seem likely to arise, uh, you know, as, as, as people say their own things. And, you know, will the return of fans then play a part in this? You know, uh, you can see, you might have seen James McLean, uh, the Irish player, complaining this week uh, that no one showed him any solidarity when uh, when he was being abused for being Irish and so on. And so without getting into the, the particular merits of, of McLean's uh, case there, I think it is clear that the abuse for him that he suffered over years does reflect uh, a reactionary current in the, in the support there. You know, it reacts, it, it re reflects this, you know, not everybody going to a football match in England uh, is of a, is of a, the same mind as, say, the players appear to be on the issue of Black Lives Matter. It'll be interesting to see the just how the fans then interact with this uh, as they come back. Um, you know, longer term, uh, just to, just to wrap up, I don't. It, it's obviously hasn't been good for the the sport. Uh, the the nothing, nothing about this has been good. Uh, this long layoff, this sort of undignified rush back, the kind of, it, it's so blatantly being a money grabbing exercise, you know, the sort of the football without fans is nothing, but like, you know, actually we're, we're still going to do it. Um, 
the fake crowd noise, the, the, the big empty stadiums, like the sense that, the sense when you watch these games that you're wasting your life in a very, you know, in a very real sense, it's like, why am I doing this? What's gone wrong in my life that has resulted in me watching this nonsense? Is there nothing better I could be doing? You know, and I think lots of people are, are, are kind of being confronted with that decision and, and maybe saying, well, there are other ways I can spend my weekend, you know? The, like the story of, of football, particularly the Premier League over the last 30 years has been like uninterrupted success, growth, uh, almost uninterrupted, there's been a couple of little speed bumps, but generally speaking, the direction of travel has been upwards and fast. But, you know, nothing grows like that forever. Uh, and you do wonder, um, you do wonder how there, if, if this period and, and some of the things that have happened are going to do some, some long-term damage. I don't necessarily mean the, the uh, I don't mean the political aspects. Um, in, in the United States, for instance, you'll get lots of conservatives who will say, well, you know, I don't watch it anymore because of politics. You know, it's, 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 it's ruined everything. I don't, I don't agree with that. I actually I find it makes it a lot more interesting. In fact, it makes it, if anything, more interesting as a, as a spectacle. But, you know, in America, you've got the example of baseball, a sport that has declined, a sport that everybody used to play. Um, that sort of forgot its audience a bit. The audience aged in the same way the audience of football has aged. And now it's a sport that's really only popular in, in you know, retirement villages and nursing homes. Uh, that's, that's what happens when you take your eye off the ball for, for, for a couple of years. Things move fast. So, um, yeah, I'm not saying the Premier League's at that, at that point yet, but it has been a fairly traumatic few months. Brilliant, Ken. Thanks very much for that. Um, we're just there's a couple of questions coming in already. If you just want to keep submitting them through, we'll we'll get to them. Just want to do a little bit of a chat now. Um, I suppose, Ken, picking up on the sporting point that you you were just touching upon, is you know the European Championships, the Euros final was supposed to be Sunday gone, um, it was going to be the first European Championships that happened all over Europe, um, rather than having a dedicated host country. I mean, of all the years for that to be. The plan, that's still the plan as far as I understand it for next year. How do, how do you see that going? Obviously, it's very hard to predict, but, um, you know, teams traveling all over Europe for an international tournament next summer. Mm. The plan has always been a really bad plan. I mean, the plan was never a plan. You know, the, the only reason they had to go with this plan was that they, they couldn't get anybody to actually host this tournament. You know, they were, they were, look, they, first of all, they've increased the size of the tournament to 24 teams from 16. 24 teams. It used to be eight teams, you know, so you, well, you, you know, eight was maybe too small. 16 was, it seemed like enough, but they've boosted to 24. Now you've got a tournament that's so big, you know, who can afford to host it? You know, Germany, France, that's it. You know what I mean? The, the, you know, the Turkey was kind of looking, oh, well, are we interested in this? You know, they were like, well, they ended up saying, well, why don't we just have it everywhere? Uh, we can fly around, you know, there won't be any problem with that. You know, we live after all in the age of air travel. We live in the, the age of cheap air travel of planes just blasting around everywhere, leaving, you know, vapor trails across the skies, crisscrossing the skies of Europe to go to football matches. You know, Baku, why don't we have matches in Baku? Why don't we, why don't we fly Wales supporters thousands of miles out to Baku to watch a European Championships match? The same as, you know, obviously it was a terrible idea, but you know, this time last year, it looked like it was going to be a terrible idea just because it was so grotesque in terms of like people's sort of uh, sense that maybe climate change is going to be a problem. You know, for us, like maybe this is kind of, maybe this is really insane what we're doing here. Maybe it's like, how, like, how do we ever think this was a good idea? But in, in fact, it's a bad idea because, well, well, we all know why. Uh, so it got cancelled. Uh, it's, it's, it's supposed to happen next June, but you know, who can like no one knows no one knows it's going to happen they'll try and they'll try and squeeze it in because there's a lot of money riding on it you know they've 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 sold the tv contracts the same way as as the leagues have it's the same problem so they need to have the the tournament but whether they're going to be able to have it no nobody knows yet and barra just on yourself i mean mm. you you obviously painted a bit of a, a bleak picture on the on the Economic side of things, um, there's much talk. Yeah, not, not as bleak as Ken's, as it turned out, but yeah. No, no, Ken's a bit bleaker again. You know, it got progressively bleaker as we went on. Um, in terms of the July stimulus, what, what, what do you think of that? I mean, obviously the UK, you know, we, we, we look across the water all the time and see what they're up to. Um, they've, they've done a big sort of stimulus package um, that's got the different sectors in Ireland talking. How do you expect the, 
July stimulus to go and, and, and what areas do you think need to be? Yeah. So we we'll probably look across the narrow water too, too often and not uh, far enough to cross to, to the, 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 the larger waters either to our west or east uh, enough. But you know, it looks like there's going to be some announcements next week. Who knows how big they're going to be? Um, there's a real issue of should you be stimulating the economy at this point or should you just be still trying to protect people's incomes? Um, so it's not clear that it's necessarily the right time. They might call it a stimulus, but who knows if it, if it is or isn't. But, you know, there, there's, there's, there's real uncertainty about that. Like, you know, one of the issue, things that's been talked about, one of the things that they did over in the UK was to give people, I think, 50% off take, or no, not takeaways, 50% off eating out in restaurants. Um, but, I mean, that's kind of precisely exactly the type of thing that we're not really sure is it all right yet. And is that the type of thing we should be encouraging at that point, or should we be saving that up for some future points in a few months' times and just focusing on protecting people's incomes? It, I mean, it, it is a tricky one because there is no right answer um, and it, everything's so uncertain. But uh, to the extent that what, what, what can we do? I mean, there is, there is probably more that can be done to support the incomes of people or to, to target, I suppose, the income supporters in, in, in better ways. So at the moment, it, it's quite broad brush and they made it quite broad brush because they wanted to get the money out there and get out there quick. And they did that very well. I mean, actually, if you want to compare us to kind of across the water on that front, you know, we announced our wage subsidy. We announced our pandemic unemployment payment after um, the British government had announced theirs and we got it paid much quicker uh, a few weeks beforehand. So, you know, there, there was a virtue to doing that. But now we're in a position where, OK, if you are worried about targeting, then maybe there are certain groups you want to focus on. And in my mind, the clear group that you want to focus on is renters. And that, you know, that's really going to think become an issue in the coming months. It, there might have been a build-up of arrears, um, but in part, I think that's likely to be down to the fact that you had people who were on the pandemic unemployment payment. But as that, as level of that come down, then I think you are into a situation where you need to try focus for towards people need it. And renters really are the group that, that stand out on that front, for me anyway. And Nadine, you mentioned, you know, in particular, looking at other countries, you mentioned Germany's um, approach to supporting artists. I mean, is there anything in particular that you think that artists are looking for out of this package? And, you know, that, that long ministry that you mentioned um, that Catherine Martin's now in charge of, um, you know, what prospects and hopes do you have for, for the deliverance and, 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 and supports for artists? Well, I think there's a perception um, that at the moment organizations are being supported over artists so for example the arts council you know continues and and some of the the bigger um organizations that have always gotten their funding they are getting funding to continue and it's their job to sort of distribute the funding if you like and that's sometimes a little bit uncomfortable for some artists to see and because you know artists who for example have always applied for funding. Some artists are really good at applying for funding and they're maybe not actually that popular. I hate to say this, but I mean, but still they're not, it's not that they're not worthy in their own way, but maybe they're really, really good at applying for funding, okay? And then there are other artists who are authors or musicians or, you know, people that, that whose names you would know, right? Who play Whelan's, who, who publish books that you love and who are on, less than 20 grand a year you know they're on the lower income uh, but they didn't apply for funding because maybe they didn't believe in it or maybe they thought they could manage on their own but because they didn't they're now not within this bracket of uh, this kind of coterie who had applied for funding and the government have said okay these people that applied for funding they're going to get their funding even if they don't do that festival or if they don't deliver this thing in quite the way that we thought they were going to and there's this whole swathe of artists who are outside that bracket who are very genuine artists who are really talented uh, who didn't use the kind of um, that safety net of the Arts Council and I think there probably is a problematic divide between these two types of of people these this within the bracket arts council people and the outside the bracket the the bands who you're excited about you know there was an article in the sunday times last weekend which described how much money uh, a band uh, called the Fontaines DC, who were just about to release their second album, were paying themselves, you know, from their from their collective income per year, and it was really really small. And you know, the the, the article was a tiny bit like. I don't know, sneery is probably the wrong word, but it, you know, pointing out somebody's income when you don't earn terribly much and you're a popular band, like it's, it shouldn't be, I don't, I don't think it's terribly fair in lots of respects. 
uh, because it doesn't reflect how people view the band or, or, or the love and affection they have for the band or the band's artistic merit. Uh, so to some extent, I think we need to look at how we structure um, how we pay people. What Germany have done and Scotland is they, they are literally um, allowing people to apply to continue to be artists and they trust them. They, there's a community there and there's a sense of trust. They say, go and do your thing and, and we believe, you know. And I know that's a big leap to take, particularly for a small country like Ireland. Uh, but, you know, they have increased funding. There was a, a 25 million increase in Ireland, but it pales by comparison to the funding increase that's been the case in other countries. And for a country, as I've said, the punch is above its waist artistically. I think we could stand to do more. And I hope the new minister will, will want to do more. Brilliant. Ken, just going back to yourself and a point you raised about the sort of politicisation of sport. Um, you know, you mentioned the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, one thing I'd just be interested to get your view on is, you know, that that movement and sort of football's um, appreciation of the movement and, and, and drawing attention to it has come when we've seen like really abhorrent uh, instances of racism. I mean, the, the Wilfred Zaha messages, the Ian Wright messages, the David McGoldrick messages, for example. I mean, what do you make of the sort of the contrast between what the sport is doing and, and what's happening with online abuse? Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, the, I mean, obviously those things are there are really terrible. Uh, they're not really. I mean, did you see that they had arrested a twelve-year-old for the Zaha? I think it was a Zaha case. Was some twelve-year-old had? Yeah, had similar. To Kerry actually, the the guy who was doing the Ian Wright one was only a teenager. Yeah, and and I mean, there again, like that. This this there's a kind of an element of farce to that as well. You know, like you're talking about a twelve-year-old. Like what he's written is disgusting. Like God knows, you know, how does how does a twelve year old end up sending this to 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 a football player? At the same time, like what do you, what do you achieve by arresting a twelve year old? You know what I mean? It's I don't know. Like I mean, I think that all the all that they can do in football, really. I mean, these these things sort of reflect the wider society. Football is kind of a small and unrepresentative microcosm of that, uh, and all they can do is really is is sort of show a lead. You know, if they, they're like, well, this is what we think we should stand for. I mean, for years and years, they haven't been allowed to stand for anything and they haven't been expected to. And anybody who's kind of, I mean, it's not long since Graham Lasso uh, was, it was famous in football. It was a famous fact and a ludicrous, like a, a kind of a, can you believe that fact that Graham Lasso, you, what, what is it about Graham Lasso that he read which newspaper? It's The Guardian. He read the Guardian. The fact that Graham Lassell read the Guardian was like this. Oh, you know, who does he think he is? You know, he's he's like, Whoa. Uh, you know, um, the uh, the professor like is reading the Guardian. Uh, that was the sort of general tone sort of surrounding these these guys. So there wasn't really, you know, they might occasionally say, well, you know, I vote Tory because the tax is lower. I don't want to pay tax. That was kind of the level of of things, and obviously that's that's sort of changed quite a lot. I, I mean, I think that's a sort of a generational change you, know, you can see just just younger people now are i think a, a lot more engaged with a lot of these things I mean, there's a, there seems to be a lot more at stake i think than there was sort of in the late 1990s you know what i mean there, there seems to be a lot more uh, you know up for grabs there's a real flux here and also people have the means of expression um and and also i guess the pressure to to take a position on things you know what I mean like it's not it's not just uh, it's not simply that you can say things it's like well if you're not saying it why why are you not what do you think what you know are you not going to use your platform for good you know this kind of thing so it's not just these these sort of 12 year olds writing horrible racist messages you have like a kind of a, a previously uh, a public you know publishing or broadcasting power that that previously only you, you had to speak to the media the media had that power they controlled access to that and you know, they they sort of mocked anyone who did something crazy, like read the Guardian. You know what I mean? Whereas now, like Raheem Sterling, as he did in December 2019, can directly attack the Daily Mail to an audience which is larger than the readership of the Daily Mail, and he can analyze their coverage of uh, something that he's done compared to, or it wasn't it wasn't him actually that he chose. He chose. Uh, 
a black yeah. player and a white player in the Man City U teams. It, it was a similar story. I think they both like bought a house or, or some kind of present for their family. Maybe it was they bought a house or something. And in, in one case, the white player was like, oh, you know, isn't this great? Like, you know, what a great lad. And the other case was, oh, this is flash. Maybe it was a car or something. I can't remember exactly. And, and he was pointing this out. But, the, but the, the point is that he could do this to like millions and millions of followers on, on Instagram or whatever. Whereas previously, he just had no way of doing it. He might have been sitting there going, this really annoys me. But he, he'd have no way of saying it to, uh, to the wider world. So, um, so I guess this sort of change was always, you know, once, once that sort of power became dispersed and uh, the media lost its monopoly, uh, you know, to monopoly sort of control over who gets to speak to the audience, then this, was, this, was, this change was then always going to follow. Right, thanks for that. Um, just, just a couple of questions coming in. I suppose um, one of the first questions that came in, Barrow, was directed to yourself. It's from Alice, and she asks, is there any hope for recessionals? Um, yes. No. <laughs> well, no. Um, there, there is, but I think what, what more worries me is that it's very difficult to remedy or ameliorate some of these things once that they happen. So, for example, like we know some colleagues of mine have done research investigating what works and what doesn't of of the kind of the, the active labor market programs or the training programs that we spend money on. And we spent a lot of money on programs that we know don't improve the outcomes of people who are on them. So, you know, the community employment scheme, for example, a great scheme provides lots of social good, but does very little in terms of the the, the getting people back into the labor market, which is it's you know supposed purpose it's probably not its actual purpose now but it's what we kind of you know we we mark it down as one of our active labor market policies similarly the back to education allowance actually there's been you know research done on that which shows it's not particularly effective but on the other hand there are there is there are things that we do know that work and it's worth hopefully maybe expanding them or maybe they do offer some opportunities so for example the the, the post leaving cert courses you know we you know the amount of space in the media that's dedicated to talking about the leaving cert would sicken you any day of the week but in particular i think when that goes on when you know, not everyone by any means goes goes on to higher level, but also that, you know, further education can do so much and does so much. And we know that it is very effective and yes, you know, it doesn't get any of the coverage that 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 higher education does. So I think you know there is scope for things like that. And you know, if we are to do things like retrofit homes to make them warmer or less leaky in terms of heat, maybe there is scope for being able to retrain people from from areas outside of that but it's going to be a long and arduous and difficult task and we don't have the best tools available at the moment we're going to it's going to be really challenging to ensure that those uh, those we get we do get those in place brilliant and, and a dean a question directly to you um is from fion and he asks what's being your favorite artistic output of uh, the pandemic crisis and do you have any good book recommendations <laughs> Um, God, I've been reading, yeah, there's so many good books at the moment. Um, I'm in the middle of the new John Boyne book, which is out in a couple of weeks. And I've also been reading for nonfiction, the Mary Trump book, which is, she's the niece of Donald and she's taken it upon herself at pre-election to write this book. She's also a clinical uh, the psychologist, so she's she's giving us kind of the inside of Donald Trump's brain as as revealed by a member of his actual family, and it's very interesting actually. In the prologue, she says essentially that uh, prior to um, him becoming president, first time around, the whole family took a decision not to talk about him because they just thought, you know, family loyalty and all that. But now they're like, oh my God, <laughs> somebody must speak. So she's decided to break her silence. So that book came out just, um, well, I got a copy of it just in the last few days. So, uh, but in terms of books that I have read, over the pandemic period, um, in terms of novels, um, well, the debut by Nisha Dolan, Exciting Times, is great. It's very in the vein of Sally Rooney. If you're into uh, Sally Rooney, I'd highly recommend it. There's a book called My Dark Vanessa, which is a really, really fascinating um, take on the Lolita Nabokov's uh, tale because it actually completely, uh, I suppose, brings us to um, the, the the very... It, is, it sort of throws up what a problematic book that actually is, uh, which of course is something that we've come to realize over years. Um, but it takes the story of a very uh, a young girl who um, was abused by her teacher at school, um, but didn't ca didn't categorize it or see it uh, as that, and is now an adult and is still struggling to deal with what happened to her as a younger person. And it is one of the 
best written books of the year. I started reading it and could not, you know, couldn't uh, tear myself away from it. It's just a really, really um, absorbing, sometimes difficult, but ultimately absolutely mesmerizing novel. And then um, Carolina Donahue, the new, uh, the Irish author, has a new book. Uh, it's out an ebook now, but it's coming out in August in um, paperback, and it's called Scenes of a Graphic Nature, and it's really good to study for friendship in Ireland. And there's so many more. Um, God, um, if you're talking about Black Lives Matters movement, um, there's a book called Such a Fun Age, which is by an author, I think her name is Kylie Reed, and she is just fantastic. Uh, the book is the story of a young black babysitter who brings her charge to a supermarket and gets apprehended by security guards there uh, because uh, they think that she has kidnapped a child. Uh, and she explains to them that this is in fact the child that she's babysitting, but they're having absolutely none of it. And the book kind of unspools from there. It's it's really brilliant. But yeah, just in terms of albums then, the new Fontaine's DC album is brilliant. It's coming out at the end of the month. Uh, also, what else? M Moses Sumney, if you like, kind of a soul R&B electronica, absolutely brilliant. There's a band whose name I always get wrong and I'm going to give it a try, um, but I put the words in the wrong order. They're called Rolling Coastal Blackouts Fever or else Rolling Blackouts coastal fever anyway they're they're amazing they sound like the smiths but for the modern day like they're a melbourne band and they've just released their second album i could go on there's loads oh, with, there you uh, yeah. young, <laughs> hope you're writing a lot down uh loads of recommendations there i'm really interested to hear that to, to read that uh trump book i think it'd be really interesting yeah uh, another question that's come in from owen is um just the thing about lockdown in general that you know people have used the lockdown as a time for reflection and they've come back with sort of new perspectives and approaches to their work. Just, this is a question across the board for everybody. I want to start with you, Ken. Is there anything that you've sort of picked up from the lockdown um, that would change your approach to how, you've, how, you, how you do your work? Um, you don't really need an office. I mean, it's handy to have one, but it's quite expensive to have one as well. So do you need one? Um, so that's that's one thing. I mean, I, I don't know, like it has been, I also feel like a bit sort of um, burned out at this point. Like, I kind of feel like, I don't know. I mean, the first, the first month of it was just kind of very anxious time. Couldn't really, you know, I couldn't really sort of concentrate on much or, you know, Nadine started like talking about all these books and stuff my friend I just couldn't read anything apart from just like I couldn't weather. read it starts, yeah it's unbelievable and, and I, okay so that obviously changed um and now it's kind of just like settled into this boring routine <laughs> I mean I'm you know I complain about it being boring like which is I speak from a position of privilege that it isn't more worrying than it is but it's it's you know it's a, it's a bit of a grind like it's kind of like oh what are we all doing here this is like <laughs> I, I, I don't know so this is this is not very helpful thought, thoughts to anyone. The, I'll, I should have just stopped talking after the office point. The office, you <laughs> so know actually, uh, just on on the point of reflection or new ways of doing things. Uh, for me, when we all had to start working from home in March, I I just I like to be busy. And I, I'm really interested in health. So I started a podcast, um, the Coronavirus Ireland podcast, and I have essentially kind of a studio set up at home in a way because just from my background in radio and from podcasting generally. But I remember I rang our health editor, Susan Mitchell, and I was like, Susan, let's do like a daily podcast about health and just talk to people and get information out. And the funny thing was... Um, it provided such a great structure, I think, for both of us, like mm. starting our day to, to accumulate knowledge, to bring it to a public. Like I've, we've released 60 podcasts from March to now, you know, and at, at one point we were doing it daily, you know, every single day, seven days of the week. And I honestly think that as much as anything else, uh, for me, it was a way of, of putting my need to understand this era into, into a format that I love, mm. which is audio and podcasting. So it, it hopefully gave other people something, but it actually, I think, gave us a lot as well. You know, I think that what I found out actually was I'm, I'm just not good at like sitting at home, uh, you know, twiddling my thumbs. Like if I couldn't, I couldn't read, like, like Ken was saying, like I really mm. struggled with a book. I'd, I'd open a book and I just, I couldn't focus. Mm. But for some yeah. reason I found audio quite easy. Uh, so that was that was a relief, and I think actually in terms of ways of doing th doing things differently from now on, I've just realised I like 
as long as I've got some sort of focus, I don't need an office at all. I just need to be enthused and energized for what I'm doing. And once I've got that, and once I've given myself the ability to have the equipment to create something, then I'm happy, you know, but I think it's about finding that. And I think for people who have that barrier, you know, like I was just lucky that I had bought the equipment, but for a lot of people are now separated, separated from their mm. equipment. You know, they can't do the thing they love because they can't get into a studio or they can't get onto a stage or if they're an athlete, they can't go and do some of the stuff that they were doing in terms of training. So it's, it's just really hard. Yeah. Yeah, no, she's great to hear that uh, both, both Nadine and Ken had the same thing of not being able to read. I think the first time, first book I got around to actually being able to read was one on the Spanish flu in 1918. Uh, so that was, the, that was the first one that I actually managed, and that, that took me about two months to get on to. Uh, but yeah, I had the exact same thing. I couldn't concentrate on anything that wasn't kind of intensely related to how many people had been hospitalised that day or the economic impacts. And again, it, 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 very privileged to be able to have clouds that energy and diverted attention into doing stuff on that whereas really I, I can't imagine well I, I can't imagine but I think you can see what the results are for probably the vast majority of people who don't have that outlet and whose lives have been just suspended and put on hold and I think that's precisely one of the reasons why all of this is so hard and there being some kind of end, end point in in sight or some kind of relaxing of of things in sight is, is so important yeah yeah and just um, nearly finished up now, last five minutes. Ken, just wanted to pick you up on something you were saying about sort of the masks. And, you know, it's not a political issue here. People are just wearing them because the health professionals are telling us to do it. Whereas mm. we saw only this week, I think, you know, Donald Trump was wearing a mask and there was all this sort of clamor to congratulate him on the fact he was wearing a mask. Um, what do you sort of make of the difference of approach, you know, between Europe and the United States and and even, you know, throw Brazil into that mix as well of, of, of the approach to the pandemic. Um, how, how, have you, how have you seen that? I, I am at a loss to explain it. You know, it's just like, I'm absolutely at a loss. I mean, with, with, in the case of Trump, I, I would say it's just simply that he thought wearing a mask would make him look weak. You know, I, I'm going to look like a bitch if I wear a mask. That, I think that was literally his thought process. So I'm not going to do it. And eventually it's like like we had 15,000 infections in a day in Florida or something like please like, just put a mask on like this is actually really important now so he kind of eventually did and obviously then once he did once he does people are like oh of course you know he's always been in favor of masks you know he was on a mask for, before anybody you know the, so okay that's fair enough what what's scary more scary than that I find has been the UK and what's going on there just is really strange like I I can't work out anymore, you know, who's, <laughs> I, I just can't really figure out why anyone would necessarily be against this. I mean, th I haven't seen any good reasons for it. Uh, it's just crazy. Like it's just, I, I'm not, I know I'm not, I'm not contributing much here. I'm just saying this is, I, I do not get it. I don't understand. I mean, here, here, it, it, it strikes me the government has made a bit of a mess of it here because, I mean, I don't think it's been controversial in the sense that I don't, I haven't seen any organized group of people say, we're not wearing a mask for, you know, because for some crazy political reason, like it's it's the tyrannical imposition of by the government to demand that we do this. How dare they? I haven't seen that. I'm sure there's like, you know. But is it not to do with the fact that like the government didn't, originally the WHO did not say that wearing a mask should be mandatory and because they didn't issue that advice governments around the world were hesitant to issue that advice but but in addition because of the lack of personal protective equipment around the world people were worried governments were worried that if they did issue the advice to wear a mask even after the point that the WHO said actually you should wear a mask they were worried that all the the PPE wouldn't be going to nurses or doctors or people in kind of immediate risk zones but that people would be stockpiling and very wealthy people might be stockpiling so there's been this kind of flip-flopping on the issue which is partly uh, to be fair to to the government um, to do with first off the WHO but but then also this this more um, I guess subtle concern if you like that if they had pushed this directive out really early on in proceedings what would have happened to the nurses and the doctors um, you know I was amazed I don't know did you see that thing where Halby City d donated um, a, a ventilator and I was like 
you know, this is like a, a TV soap has a working kind of equipment and they didn't do it earlier and what? Um, but, you know, there was just like, to be fair to everyone concerned, like I, I do think that Ireland, with the exception of the nursing homes, which to be honest was, was it's just, it's, it, it's been really hard to, to square. If you take away our statistics, our, our general statistics um, are one thing, but then if you just look at the nursing homes on their own, we, we really let ourselves and the country down in that respect, I believe. Um, but in terms of like general health advice over the past few months, I think it has uh, been to our good that obviously Leah Vrecker has uh, is a medical doctor or was. Um, and for me, I feel, more protected by being by living in Ireland than I would have. I mean, there's so many other countries that I'm very glad I'm not in currently. And obviously, America is, you know, anywhere in the states is 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 just so horrific at the moment. And for people who have people in the states, it's hard to think about. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I I'm not going to say that like we're perfect that we have done exceptionally well. But I do feel um, quite protected. And I think the mask issue is a fraught one for reasons that go beyond the obvious in, in relation to the government. So, just, just on that, I suppose, as someone who lived in the UK for six years and managed to start planning and plotting the exit once uh, Brexit kind of revealed the true madness that was kind of going on there, uh, very much on board with the great to be in Ireland for this whole thing. But I, I think in, in, in a way that like, the real difficult decisions are to come at that, like, for the last few months, it's been kind of not, you know, there's been bits and places where we've kind of gone wrong and or could have done things differently or there was choices for me, but it's really in the coming months and hopefully not years but probably years ahead that the real choices start to come to come into play and there's you know and it's kind of a, it, it, it's I, w I wouldn't like to be in the position of having to make those choices i'll, I'll certainly crib and moan from the, the sidelines about them but it's it's it really isn't from now on that i think the, the big choices and decisions get to be made rather and rather than the kind of when it, the, the public health emergency is so stark and that's that's going to make the next few months and years uh, both interesting and very tiring. Brilliant. Okay, look, we'll we'll finish up there. Just eight o'clock now. Um, just like to thank all of you for joining us. Um, it was a really great discussion. It was good questions that came in. So thanks again. And uh, just to say, we'll finish up now for the month of August with our YPN, and we'll be back in September uh, with more events. So just keep an eye on your emails for that. Thanks everyone again, and uh, take care, everybody.